All right. All right. We're here. How are you? Good. All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California. You can find us at commonwealthclub.org, see our videos on YouTube, and catch up with us on Facebook and Twitter. I'm Clara Jeffrey, the editor-in-chief of Mother Jones, and it's my great pleasure to introduce to you, someone who needs no introduction, Chris Hayes, the host of MSNBC's All In with Chris Hayes, editor-at-large of The Nation, and author of a new book, A Colony in a Nation. They gave me a lot of bio stuff to read. Chris has a long and impressive resume, but I'm gonna pick out a few parts that are most relevant to this discussion. Um, Chris grew up in the Bronx, where he went to, and he went to Hunter Public School in Manhattan, where I must note that he directed Lin-Manuel Miranda's first musical. <laughs> um, Chris's first book, the Twilight of the Elites, America After Metocracy, was about how people were losing trust in institutions such as government, media, and academia, and how that could give rise to authoritarianism, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure with uh, equal foresight, um, his book, A Colony in the Nation, Chris describes uh, a country where there are really two Americas, in the nation where police are accountable and the law mostly works, and in the colony, where, people are, where the police are an occupying force that meets out arbitrary justice and exploits the colonists. So we're gonna discuss all this. Um, please give a wa warm Commonwealth welcome to Chris Hayes. So Chris, before we get started, I just wanna acknowledge, we talked about a, little, a little bit about this in the green room, but um, this is, a particularly insane couple of weeks to be on the road <laughs> doing, I think, four events today on top of your show. Um, and, uh, you know, and he's just as indefatigable as ever. Um, we'll see. <laughs> you guys will be the judge of that. Yeah. Uh, so we'll, we'll come back a bit to Trump and, and some current events, but let's first set up the central point of your book. Um, when ex exploring the inequities in the criminal justice system, why did you settle on the idea of a colony within a nation as the instructive metaphor? Um, I think it started when I was doing reporting in Ferguson, and um, it was just so apparent, it just struck me how much uh, law enforcement there felt like an occupying force. Um, and the stories that, um, people would tell me over and over and over again in Ferguson were these, these stories of this kind of uh, capriciousness, arbitrariness, and, and, and fundamentally stories of humiliation. A kind of humiliation at the hands of state power that is in a deep sense like in tension with what our most fundamental democratic commitments are. Like when I went to Ferguson, I, I, I kept thinking about the Gadsden flag. Mm -hmm. Like, Aston flag is that yellow flag that's been adopted by the Tea Party that's the coiled snake hissing, saying, don't tread on me. And that's a colonial era revolutionary flag that basically says, um, I am an autonomous citizen, not just a subject of the king's whims, that I control my body and my space, that I have self-determination, and I demand that those basic natural endowments of liberty uh, be recognized by, by the state. And that was nowhere to be found in Ferguson. I mean, people felt that way, <laughs> but that was not the way the police treated people. So I was thinking a lot about this, and then I, I, I was doing some reading, and I went back to look at the original kind of law and order speech, which is Richard Nixon's 1968 convention speech at Miami Beach, the Republican National Convention. And keep in mind, 68, of course, is uh, this horrible year for uh, so many different reasons, MLK's assassination, RFK, riots. Um, and Nixon says, uh, you know, he, he sort of lays out his law and order argument in that speech, where he says, it's time tonight for some frank talk about the problem of order in this country. That an argument he makes that um, the disintegration of order was leading to a disintegration of law, an unraveling of the society. And at one point, in a kind of gesture of faux equanimity, he says, uh, you know, and black citizens, they, they want just the same as, as, as everyone. 
They don't want to be just the sort of um, recipients of state aid. They don't want to be a colony in a nation. And I encountered that sentence when I was, had just come back from, it was months after I come back from Ferguson, and I'd also been, been in Baltimore, and I had been thinking about this sort of Tea Party nature mm. of, uh, of the kinds of violations in Ferguson. And that phrase clicked into my head, and, and then I went back and I started reading history of the American Revolution. And, you know, there's a long tradition, I should note here, the long tradition of uh, particularly black nationalists, black Marxist intellectuals who talked about the concept of a colony uh, and internal colonization. Stokely Carmichael, as Kwame Ture, uh, writes a book, Black Nationalism, that actually comes out the year before that 68 convention. Um, Malcolm X in the early 60s would refer to cities as occupied territories, as police states. In the speech about Oakland, he talks about the police as an occupying force. So this is a long intellectual tradition, but instead of sort of looking at, at the kind of particulars of that tradition, I actually went back to the, just the original colonial experience in the U.S., and what I found there was that a lot of our own experience uh, as a colony was chafing at excessive policing. Yeah, you, you talked about how the British authorities inflicted something kind of like stop on, and frisk on American colonists, and, and how in part that was due to an illicit system that had grown up to sort of get the colonists what they needed and wanted. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 in the colonies, right, so the British set up this kind of mercantilist empire that, according to the logic of mercantilism at the time, the entire point of it, right, is to expropriate resources, to control these domains, and then to use tariffs uh, to extract revenue from all the exchanges. Um, it's the reason, for instance, that years later, right, Ga Gandhi would uh, lead civil disobedience of weaving cloth or making salt because the British banned that because they wanted uh, uh, captured markets to have to deal with the British and pay the tariffs on that. So you couldn't get legally uh, goods in the colonies that came from outside British territories, largely. That meant Madeira wine from rival Empire Portugal, which George Washington loved and drank <laughs> illegally. <laughs> uh, but chiefly, it also meant molasses. Now, molasses is coming from the, the Dutch Indies, mostly, uh, another rival power. And molasses is the input for rum. Rum is the biggest product in the colonies. In fact, it is the economic lifeblood of the colonies, and it's all running on smuggled illegal goods. In fact, it's not that different than the way drugs operate now. Uh, the state decides a certain good needs to be... Uh, prohibited or sort of regulated out of existence. Uh, demand still exists for that good in spite of the state's decree, and a black market rises up to fill the demand. So you have this smuggling economy that is the lifeblood. The Brits sort of realize this, and they don't actually enforce it that much. You have this huge smuggler class that includes people like, for instance, John Hancock, <laughs> who maybe you've heard of, right? <laughs> So this isn't just at the margins, this is at the core of it. And then after the Seven Years' War, the French-Indian War, when the Brits find themselves in this deficit situation, they decide that they're going to make up the revenue shortfall by enforcing the customs laws. And this inaugurates what Clara referred to, the first stop and frisk era. They start cracking down, searching every boat. They start seizing goods and bringing customs cases, and it drives the colonists crazy. The colonists respond by beating to a bloody pulp customs officers, dragging through the streets and tarring and feathering them, stealing back confiscated goods from the custom house when it's taken, jury nullification. <laughs> customs officials complain they can never get juries to convict on customs charges <laughs> because no one thinks it's a crime. And you see this escalating sort of war on smuggling, this escalating form of increasingly draconian police enforcement. And the colonists um, recognize this as a kind of fundamental threat to their dignity and humiliation. There's, when they start bringing in the naval officers and naval ships to militarize the police, Benjamin Franklin talks about how you're converting the, the brave 
sailors of your navy, neighbor to pimping tide waiters. And he says, oh, this will work admirably. It's really interesting to, to have read that history through your eyes, and then when you jump back to Ferguson and talk about how when the Department of Justice's report came out and we realized just how much the mostly black populace of that city was wrung dry by fines and fees and tickets and court costs, um, and that it wasn't a surprise to them, of course, they were living it, but it was a surprise to the rest of America, or at least white America, and even, I think, the white citizens of Ferguson. Yeah, it, it, the, the, the DOJ report on Ferguson, um, which essentially describes a, a, a kind of extractive regime, not unlike the one that I just described, in which policing is primarily not for public safety, but to extract revenue. Um, that report is about 60 or 70 pages. It's online, and I would, I would urge everyone to read it because it's so shocking. It's so shocking partly because no one tries to hide it. No. It's like the city manager says to the police chief, like, when do you think you can get that revenue pipeline set up with the new enforcement corridor in this part of the city? Meaning, like, we're short, we need money, so you need to go out there and hit this ticket quota. And it's not just tickets, of course. It's this incredibly uh, maddening Kafka-esque Rube Goldberg machine that they've constructed, whereby you get a summons, you have to go to the court, they only have six total court hours a week at certain points, three hours on one day, three hours on the next. There's such demand, you can go and show up, and then you don't get in. You then get fined for missing your court date. There are people that start out with a simple parking violation who end up owing $550 and doing time in jail because eventually, right, there's a warrant out for you. So, so this whole system, and it's fundamentally an extractive system. You know, and, and I think it's worth noting that, as you write in the book, that this is not just Ferguson. Um, you, you speak quite eloquently about how broken windows policies establish a whole new legal system around low-level offenses. So we have folks like Eric Gardner arrested or, you know, and then killed for selling Lucy's, or someone walking down the street like Michael Brown, or the taillight violation of Walter Scott or Philando Castile. I mean, how, how deep do we think this uh, system of shaking down certain parts of our, of our uh, country is for revenue on that front? So I think that the particularities of revenue extraction and the way it happens at Ferguson um, are fairly distinct. Um, they're shared by a lot of those municipalities, and they're shared at other places. I've heard from folks who live in other places. But I don't think fundamentally that's what's wrong or the goal of policing in big cities. Mm -hmm. um, I think big cities uh, enforce those infractions for a whole bunch of other reasons. And one of them, there's some work that I cite in the book when you talk about New York and broken windows. It's actually by a, a very good friend of mine named Issa Kohler Hausman, who is a, a professor at Yale. And she writes about the misdemeanor court system that gets erected in New York City uh, as the sort of Giuliani era brings in this sort of broken windows quality of life enforcement. And quality of life means everything from public urination to literally selling MMMs on the subway, right? Selling MMMs on the subway is the kind of thing you get a misdemeanor ticket for. And she makes the argument that these court systems are fundamentally uh, different in in kind than a felony court system in that they're not even trying to divine or adjudicate the facts for a disposition about who did what. They're simply trying to sort people into categories of kinds of person. And particularly the category of the kind of person who will come to the summons and the kind of category of the person who won't, which is kind of the orderly and the disorderly, right? And that people that miss court dates because they have chaotic lives, because they're don't have access to vehicles because yada, 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 they're enmeshed in addiction, then that becomes this kind of record and this sort of stamping procedure by which people get sorted into different categories of citizens. And that fundamentally, that's part of the way the misdemeanor court is operating. And it's important to keep in mind just the sheer volume of all this, right? I mean, we have this conception of the criminal justice system largely because of our, our pop culture, you know, SVU and Law and & Order and CSI, where it's like, it's the detective with the notepad over the dead body and the yellow police tape, and then there's like a jury trial with like some dramatic cross-examination. Like, it, that, that doesn't happen. <laughs> but in a functional sense, if you were gonna be 
you know, if you're going to use, if you're going to round up, there are no jury trials in America. It's just not what the criminal justice system does. It just processes people through pleas. Just all day and all night, 24 hours a day, right now in this city and in Oakland and in Sacramento and in Fresno and everywhere in between, there's just a system that's just bodies coming in, bodies going out. And that system that is constantly operating at this incredible volume across offenses from as low as you got a summons for selling M&Ms and then you missed a court date and then you had a warrant to you murdered three people. That system, uh, the way it operates, is very hard to square with what our conceptions of procedure and constitutional rights are, particularly as enshrined in the Bill of Rights. Is there much evidence that broken windows policies work to reduce crime? It's a great question, and it's a complicated answer. Um, the statistical context for this is that between 1966 and 1991, there is a massive crime wave that takes over all of the country. It is in areas large and small, and it basically peaks in the sort of crack years, which is roughly about 88 through 91. In 1991, there are roughly uh, around 2,300 murders in New York City. By last year, there's 350. It's a remarkable decline. In fact, the decline in crime from 1991 to around 2014 is one of the great kind of sociological mysteries and miracles of our time. I mean, imagine if we brought down child poverty or carbon emissions by that number, right? So something incredible happens. And the unsatisfying answer to the question is we don't really know why. There's a lot of theories, but I'll say two things about broken windows. Number one, the people that were there that implemented broken windows, William Bratton, chief Mm -hmm. among them, and then a whole sort of generation of, of police officials, it's not crazy for them to think that they solved the problem, right? I mean, right, they were there. They were there. It happened. They put in broken windows, like they got rid of the graffiti on the subway, and then the murders declined by huge amounts. It's like, okay, A cause B. And in some ways, like you even see this, I describe in the book, it's like almost like it's like a rain dance or a cargo cult around <laughs> this kind of practice, right? Because there's a superstition that urban crime will come roaring back if we don't go through the, the rain dance, if we don't do the kind of policing we were doing before that kind of kept the crime gods at bay. And this was the big fear when de Blasio pulled back on stop and frisk, right? Literally, I mean, not just stop and frisk, but even quality of life. Like, the New York tabloids went crazy when there were topless women taking photos with strangers in Times Square because it was like, well, here it goes. <laughs> <laughs> you give an inch, they'll take a mile, next thing you know. <laughs> And, and in fact, he had, to re- he had to retreat. They had to crack down. <laughs> Which again, like, I'm, you know, I don't know your particular views on that, uh, that <laughs> issue. But it is such an overwhelming force. And of course, stop and frisk was the same thing. The police union, Ray Kelly, all these people said, if you get rid of stop and frisk, you'll see crime escalate in the city. And the opposite happened, actually. Stop and, stop and frisk, as captured in New York City data, goes down around, the stops go down around 80 or 90 percent. Crime continues to fall uh, at the same time. Now, to get to the empirical point, there, there are people who have done empirical surveys who say order maintenance, broken windows policing does work. There are some who say it doesn't work. There are meta studies that say in the aggregate, it's some small portion of the crime drop that can be accounted for. But the final thing I'll say about this is the category itself is a tough one to get your head around because people kind of call everything broken windows. Right. And I think you, you point out that crime has, you know, precipitously fallen over the past two decades, and yet public opinion doesn't see that at all. They think it's going up even when it's going down dramatically, which is remarkable. Why do you think that that is? Every year there's surveys, Gallup is one of them, and there's a few others who say, like, did crime go up or down last year? And, like, everyone always says up. <laughs> like, year after year after year after crime drops, year after year after year. And I think that has to do with just the power of the politics of law and order and, and, and particularly the kind of evocation of white fear. Yeah. You know, the, 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 to me, one of the central cultural inheritances we have as a sort of society, as a polity, is, is this experience of white fear. And 
what Can I you mean. Peel back the layers of that. Yeah, yeah. I want to that that term. I mean, the 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 the. the it starts the first day that the first ship that settles Jamestown shows up, and the first diary entry the captain is, we were set upon by the savages, right? And that experience of this, of, of this settler nation is remarkably bloody, terrifying, and terrifying even for the people that are winning. I mean, ultimately, the settlers engage in ethnic cleansing and extinguish the people that are there before, and yet, if you read their accounts, there's a great book on this called The Barbarous Years by Bernard Balin. If you read their accounts, they're constantly terrified. The same thing for the, the planter patriarchs of the antebellum South, who have slaves under the whip and live in this constant fear of rebellion. There are notices all the time in the local papers about the rebellion that there was a slave revolt here, and it was only brought down by because the, the boys came around, the sons, and they had guns. Now, at a certain level, right, from a moral level, it's perverse to linger on the fear of the settler or the slaver, because that's not our moral concern. Our moral concern is the people who are on the wrong end of that exchange, right? But as a descriptive matter, there is a continuity in this country of fear in the hands of the conqueror, fear in the hands of the powerful, fear in the hands of the relatively privileged, that the order they think they've created for themselves is delicate enough that it can be overrun by disorder that's constantly beckoning. And that disorder is so often embodied in the bodies of people that are not white, right? And that's the theme that comes through all the way through law and order politics of Richard Nixon, with the images of urban rioting running through the newsreels of the time, all the way down to the idea that America is disordered and in decline and that building a wall will keep out those forces. You know, it's interesting when you mention protests because one of the things that you write about in the book is how, um, perhaps because of, you know, Nixon's ads and speeches, but that people started to conflate protests with street crime. Um, and that really made me think about what's happening now. Do we, are there indications that people did that over, say, Occupy or Black Lives Matter protests? And how should potential protesters and the media think about how to cover or engage yeah. in protests as a result? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, I think we've absolutely seen that in the last three or four years. In fact, people are... Around the country, people make an explicit argument that the protests, particularly that start in the wake of Michael Brown's death, have been the trigger to precipitate a rise in homicides in the largest cities in America. Um, Sam Dotson, who is the, was the police chief of St. Louis, called it the Ferguson effect. That term has been picked up by a whole bunch of people. And statistically, there have been sharp increases in the last two years particularly in homicides, in some of the 25 biggest cities. St. Louis is one of them, Baltimore as well, Milwaukee, Cleveland, a few others. So you're already seeing that argument called right back, right? Rahm Emanuel referred to members of the Chicago Police Department as being in a fetal position in the wake of police protests because they couldn't do their job because they were under so much scrutiny. Um, the answer that a former cop once said to me on my show was, if you can't do your job constitutionally, you should get another job, right? Like, we have standards for how the state conducts itself, and there has to be a way for the state to conduct itself and police to conduct themselves in that fashion that is also effective at providing public safety and security. Yeah, it's, it's also amazing how, you know, particularly with the early Ferguson protests, um, how people would watch that and some people would see this incredibly militarized police state, you know, going into a neighborhood and other people would see this as an unruly mob. Um, and I'm wondering, how do you guys handle that on your show, knowing that it, this isn't so much what you do, but knowing that when you show, say, recently, the, the footage of, you know, a trash can in D.C. being lit on fire and that thing just loops through cable news Did you guys like see that days. during the inauguration? 
this sort of iconic, there was like a one trash can on fire. <laughs> it's like, and that's all, yeah. And then there was like a had. picture of like 50 photographers <laughs> taking a picture of the trash can. And it's funny that you brought that up because I have said to people like, we will, like, there is a reason that there are countries where the highest rated show is the Yule Log. <laughs> Because if you put something on fire, man, a camera loves fire. <laughs> like, you light something on fire, we will stick a camera on that thing. And it cracked me up when I saw that trash can, because it was like exactly the rule. It's like, ooh. Right, and it was like the smallest, most pathetic version yeah, of that. It wasn't even like, there was an right. infamous thing here about 10 years ago when a Foot Locker was lit on fire. And this is a big joke on Twitter, on San Francisco Twitter, of the Foot Locker whenever there's a protest. but. You know, that was at least a building. I mean, I don't mean to diminish right. the fact that it was real property damage, but it was a real fire. Right. But in this case, it was like all they had was a trash can. Right, and I think that the, I think that the, the, particular, the particular medium that I work in, um, in my, for my show, is, is a medium that um, has a formal, has, a, has formal incentives and market incentives to elevate spectacle over context. Um, wow, you guys, are you surprised by that? Uh, Twitter uh, goes nuts. Uh, I think that's true, and I think partly that's because um, our job is to grab and hold people's attention um, because that's the business I'm in, is keeping eyeballs. And there's a real tension between your journalistic commitments to context and, and the sort of spectacle of witness. And... Personally, what we try to do is marry those in a way that's responsible. Um, but we don't always succeed um, because it's fundamentally hard. Those two things are in, like, deep tension. You know, there's, there's been a lot of debate um, over whether Trump's kind of core base voted out of economic anxiety or out of um, racist impulses. But your book, I think, makes a pretty convincing uh, argument that those that's often two sides of the same coin. Fear that you're b being moved from the nation, as it were, to the colony. That's right. I think that, yeah, I think the sort of, you know, economic anxiety, uh, bigotry debate is, like, constructed in such a way to, like, keep the hot takes coming. Yeah. Um, <laughs> rather than sort of get to the bottom of the issue. I think that Donald, I, the way I think about it is, is this way. There, there's something sort of um, remarkable and paradoxical about the following. Billionaire real estate heir lives in literally a gold-plated <laughs> tower. <laughs> Has only lived in New York. Like, is a creature of New York real estate and uh, show business. Somehow, like, connects emotionally and viscerally to, like, the disaffected workers of Mahoning County, Ohio. Right? Like, what's that about? And I think the answer to that is that Donald Trump's entire experience, formative years that are core to him, was the experience of New York City in decline. The 80s particularly. Crime is going up. Things are getting worse. The subways are covered in graffiti. We're being overrun. Disorder beckons. So that's one part of that experience. The other part of that experience is a particularly racialized conception of who's responsible for that, right? This is the man that took out the full page ad about the central powder jogger attackers. And it turns out that this particular experience of decline and the idea that like the colony was coming to get the nation, take it over, that's endlessly exportable across the country in a totally different context. It turns out that plays in Kenosha, Wisconsin, Mahoning County, Ohio, Erie County, Pennsylvania, and McDowell County, West Virginia. So if we go back to the sort of layers of white fear, there's sort of this explicit racism and, and then kind of implicit bias, but then there's this, this fear of loss of privilege. Um, yes, which I think is understood less as law. I mean, the, the privilege discussion is interesting because, you know, I was just in McDowell County. Um, we did a town hall down there. McDowell County has the shortest lifespan of any county in the United States. Uh, it went for Barack Obama in 08, McCain for 2012, and by 50 points for Donald Trump. It's got the lowest life expectancy, 
48% of the folks in that county are on Medicaid. Uh, it has the highest rate of drug-induced deaths in the United States of America at 141 per 100,000. The highest the New York City homicide rate ever got in 1991 was 30 per 100,000. And when I was in a room about this size and I asked people to raise their hand if they lost a loved one to opioids, basically everyone raised their hand. So, do those people have privilege? Well, yeah, they do. Racial privilege is a real thing. White privilege is a real thing. But the discussion about privilege in that context just seems a little nutty. What the way that they understand it, and it's de it is definitely there's some aspect to it that's racialized. I don't want to downplay yeah. that. But they understand it as unraveling, as disorder. I mean, I always say this, right? Like, it always struck me that the, 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 the president, when he's on the campaign trail, would just hammer on the border, right? They're pouring over the border. And it's like, you live in Pennsylvania. <laughs> like, why do you care? <laughs> like, what, what are they going to do? They're going to come across and then, like, come to your town and get a job? But it was because the border was a symbol of this decline, disorder, lack of control, that things are not in your control, that there's this outside force that's sort of penetrating, invading, unraveling, pulling apart. That's the kind of like neurotic substrate in that rhetoric that's so powerful. It's not because it's not about the border. Like, why? it doesn't matter what's happening at the border if you live in Wisconsin. So uh, I just want to remind everyone that you're listening to the Commonwealth Club of California program. Our guest is Chris Hayes, author, MSNBC host, editor at large of the nation. I'm Clara Jeffrey, your moderator for the program. And you can catch Commonwealth Club programs on the radio and on YouTube. And of course, follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Um, I, I want to return to the, to the uh, opioid epidemic um, because I, I think it's, it's going to be a really interesting moment to see if the compassion um, amongst white people, frankly, um, of kind of all classes towards this epidemic uh, is very different than we saw during the crack epidemic, do you think that this has the uh, potential to really change the conversation about this element of law and order? I think it does. Um, there, there is a great New York Times article about this called When Addiction Has a White Face, and it was about the, the sort of different ways that the rhetoric, particularly political rhetoric, is centered around uh, opioids versus crack, right? And you saw this really in the town halls in New Hampshire, which were fascinating because, you know, the, the candidates didn't go there being like, let's talk about opioids, but they went up there to talk to voters, and then people get up and talk about opioids. And next thing you know, you had kind of candidates in, engaged in a sort of like empathy off about how... Um, <laughs> you know, this viral clip about empathy versus this viral clip about empathy. And I think there's a genuine sort of rage and frustration for folks that lived through the crack years to watch this happen because the way that crack addicts and people in the throes of that addiction were talked about was the most sort of despicably dehumanizing language you could imagine, right? So there's a sense of like, okay, now it's white America that's being hit by this epidemic. Uh, people of, 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 of relatively high social capital in some cases. We're going to get a different approach. We're going to get treatment as opposed to punishment. And I still think that's an open question, frankly. Because I think the punishing impulse is so strong. I mean, Joe Manchin from West Virginia is talking about it, launching a new war on drugs. Like, that's not the new rhetoric. A war gets fought with bullets and tanks. So if he's talking about a new war on drugs, that's about that same sort of punitive impulse. And I, I agree with you. I think it's a fascinating moment to see which way we go in addressing what's happening with opioids, which, by the way, I just want to say, you cannot overstate the magnitude of what's happening right now. It's, it, is, it is statistically... The charts you look at look like, the only thing they look like is like carbon emissions. They're hockey stick charts. Yeah. And I think here in San Francisco, we see it in all forms, but we see it manifest itself most evidently in um, the homeless population that we have here and how that has gotten larger and, and uh, you know, that it, it is 
it is not just confined to the small towns in West Virginia that we're seeing it kind of yeah. across the country in, in every kind of way. And I think when people start to put that together, it really is startling. Um, you know, the last few years have been a really painful examination of police misconduct. Um, but you, you mentioned that part of, part of that dynamic is that maybe we expect too much of our police. Yeah, that, that point you just made about addiction is a perfect example, right? So think about an addict, right? How are they going to start interacting with the state? The most likely point of interaction is going to be a police officer. They're going to get busted for a theft, or they're going to be in a situation in which um, they have the cops called on them because they're disorderly or unruly or homeless. And the police are the kind of way in which the state interacts with citizens across a very wide range of social ills. I mean, a huge part of what you do as a cop, if you're a beat cop, is just show up into scenes of disorder. A uh, man is leaving with his girlfriend from their driveway, but the ex-girlfriend has parked them in. And now they're screaming at each other. Right. You're 27 years old and went through police academy. Go. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, I mean, we expect them to be social workers and EMTs yeah, I mean, that's, and that, marriage counselors. That's like a, yeah. that, and that's like every day. Stuff like that, right? Noise complaint, neighbor beefs, uh, accusations of theft that can't be borne out, right? My neighbor's stealing my mail. Go over to the neighbor, you're stealing a mail? No. You know, what do you do? And, and so there's, there's, this, there's a degree to which, like, the, the amount of, of latitude the police officers have, the, the degree to which they sort of have to kind of survive by their wits and their authority in every situation, because really all they have are, is, you know, their, they have their voice, they have their body, they have their badge, and they have their gun. And... Underlying all that is not only the fact that police are the, the people we call in all these situations, or the people that, that are sort of the front lines of this, but we also are in a country with 300 million guns, which means every one of those interactions from slightly comical ones, from, you know, are you stealing your neighbor's mail, to much more serious ones, um, you never know if the gun's going to come out. And in fact, that's what police officers train for. And that, I think, you know, is my contention in the book. It fundamentally alters the psychology of policing. You actually went to a police training facility and put yourself through um, use of force and implicit bias trainings. Can you just talk a little bit about what you discovered? Yeah, there's these, like, you know, these virtual reality trainers where you have, like, a, a retrofitted Beretta that fires an in infrared uh, beam but with actual action and you have this thing put on you where you can get a shock and you have these scenarios that the, the the sergeant who is the trainer is controlling where you know you show up and there's a guy so the first one i show up if there's a guy in an empty lot standing in the back of a pickup truck tossing cinder blocks out of it is that illegal i don't know i guess <laughs> Would a police officer in my position, who's like right out of the academy, know? I don't know. But I show up and I, I try to command, you know, authority. I say, you know, what are you doing? He's, ah, I knew you guys would get called. My friend told me I could dump here. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm going to have to ask you to stop. No, I don't want to stop. Would you, put the, would you put the cinder block down, sir? Yeah, I'll put it down. He raised it above his head. I draw my weapon. So the police sergeant's like, did you need to draw the weapon? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> like, no, I'm standing far away that he's not going to hit me with the cinder block. And in some ways, you know, I, I, should, I should say this because it's important that these training things are, are there, there is a slight kind of PR propaganda aspect to them because it's a way for police departments to try to get they, they wanted the liberal media host they to want, come in. Right. Here. They want you to think like, oh, not so, you know, not so smart now, buddy, <laughs> right? Like, it's real easy to second guess. It's much harder to do. Um, but there's also some truth to that. And, and, but, but the other thing about it was that, the, you know, 
part of the difficulty here in terms of the training regime is if you've ever gone through any kind of workplace safety training, right, it focuses on the most sort of catastrophic stuff, necessarily. So at the beginning of every flight, right, you talk about where, what to do in the case of a crash, but, you know, airplane travel's inordinately safe. It's incredible, and we very rarely crash, so do that. Um, so, you know, and that's true in, in factory work, it's true in, in, in lumber yards, and it's true in this case in that what police train the most for is the most catastrophic thing, which is being the subject of violence, shot and killed. But in training for that, disproportionately, you are producing a kind of conception of threat that is quite elevated. And I think that has a real effect. Again, the, the numbers that you mentioned and that bear out across the country about the proportion of you know, training to use a gun, training for other kinds of force, and then anything that's about de-escalation are startling. Yeah, it's basically you know, about 10% of the total training time goes to you know, de-escalation sort of verbal jujitsu. And I, you know, I, you know, I've interviewed a lot of cops and I've been talking to cops for over the course of the last several years reporting on this stuff and I have them on my show a lot and there are people that I'm in kind of constant dialogue with and you know, they will say, there's a guy, Steve Osborne, who I quote in there is an incredible character, a great writer too, actually. He's written a few books that like, when you see a cop who can really use their words and control a situation, it's like a, it's like a magic trick. When, when, when a police officer can walk into one of those disorderly con situations and kind of use both a projection of authority, cajoling, jokes, empathy, listening, their voice, to like bring that situation to, to a resolution, like it's incredible. Um, but again, that's hard. Uh, and it's just not clear to me, like, is that the thing the police should do? Well, it sort of goes back to that, that uh, kind of the central premise of your book, that there's this inclination to then sort, I imagine, in part thinking that will make the job easier. These are the people who are going to be disorderly and troublemakers. These people are probably okay. 300 million right. guns in the world. They probably right. have more of them. It's a sort of shortcut heuristic, right? And it's also the case, I mean, the other thing I would say about, you know, being a police officer, there's a lot of things about police culture particularly that I think um, are both interesting and oftentimes really problematic. Um, this sort of warrior mentality, you know, you've got, I, I quote in the, in the Baltimore Patterns and Practices report from the DOJ that uh, uh, there's a police officer who's telling his subordinates before they go out and patrol, um, do not treat uh, cr criminals like citizens. <laughs> like there's these two categories, there's citizens who are there to protect, and there's criminals, right? But like the whole point of the Constitution <laughs> <laughs> is that those are the same category. Right. We're all citizens, right? right? I, and I don't know if this quote is part of that, but the remarkable thing about the Baltimore um, report is that so much of this was done knowing that they were DOJ inspectors right Often there. Often with them in the back of the car during ride-alongs. So it was just so, so natural. It wasn't even That's a, right. right. So there's, there is this kind of, there's a sort of warrior mentality and there's, I think there's real problems with institutional, not just institutional bias, but there's also this sort of culture of protection for the relatively small numbers of like genuine sadists and psychopaths that exist in police departments. But in terms of the experience of policing, like, I really do think, you know, we say, oh, it's a hard job and, and we say or say that as a abstraction, but, you know, it's the nature of being a police officer, you're only interacting peop with people when they're having like their worst day and they're at their worst. No one's ever like calls the cops like bake cookies and chill, right? <laughs> like the, 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 the whole point is distress, fear, right? And so I think it takes a remarkable kind of psychological makeup to withstand the onslaught of so much constant negativity and duplicity and disorder to not get to not start to form a very dark view of humanity and not to have very dark expectations of people. That's right. Um, the cop eyes, right? Yeah. Um, Chris is going to be taking some questions in a few minutes, uh, about 15 or so minutes. Um, folks who want to ask a question, and uh, I will uh, 
urge you to make it an actual question, not a statement, and to keep that question short and to the point. Uh, please come to the microphone, which will be right here in the front. Um, you know, in recent years, there have been some really important criminal justice reforms regarding sentence disparities and mandatory minimums. Here in California, we um, overturned a lot of three strikes convictions. Uh, there was a, you know, examination of private prisons that may have resulted in some action, and then Trump got elected. Um, and I'm wondering, what have you seen from his administration so far that um, concerns you the most? <laughs> On this topic. <laughs> we got 15 minutes. <laughs> I mean, the, the correct answer is it, it, it rhymes with schmooklier modes. <laughs> On criminal justice reform. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, I think that the, to me, what is the most worrisome is just that that the, the sort of full embrace of all exact of the, the the rhetoric, the appeal, and the categories of this sort of law and order um, mindset. Um, there's been a few executive orders that are bad, but are bad in a way that's you know at the margins because they're executive orders. But there's really bad stuff that the Department of Justice can do, particularly on states' experimentation with. Marijuana legalization, I mean, if they wanted to, basically the DOJ and the FBI could just render that impossible. Um, it wouldn't take that much to just start going in and raiding uh, Colorado, uh, the Colorado industry and just saying, this is a violation of federal law and, and prosecuting and locking people up. Um, but to me, the, you know, one of the things I think it's really important to keep in mind about law, criminal justice system is there is an instinct to federalize it in our minds. To, you know, there was so much discussion about Bill Clinton and the crime bill, particularly during the Democratic primary. Do you guys remember the Democratic primary? <laughs> so long ago. <laughs> Seemed like the kind of crowd that just didn't really participate in that. <laughs> um, you know, and the crime bill, there's all sorts of ways in which I think it was a, it was a bad piece of legislation, but you know, mass incarceration, the system we have is the product of local decisions and local elections. So Donald Trump's most worrying to me on this stuff from a rhetorical perspective. The driving force is who you're electing as your local prosecutor to represent you in the city council, in the state legislature. I mean, the state legislature in this state was one of the most um, sort of punitive, expansive in the entire nation. You guys built probably, the, I mean, well, the biggest one in the whole country, but you're the biggest state. But even relative to that, right, this state was ground zero for a lot of this. Um, and that was done by a lot of the aggregation of a lot, a lot of elections with relatively small turnout, right? I mean, in some ways, for the folks that want to turn the ship around here, if you get involved in like local prosecutor elections, you can have a disproportionate effect because not that many people vote in those elections and not that many people knock on doors and not that many people give money. Are there any other policy prescriptions that you think that, that voters should be particularly eager to push? Um, you know, de-escalation training comes to mind, but what are some others that you think that, that people can actually really advocate for. Yeah, so I, I, I'm sort of careful in the book to not have like a solutions chapter. Um, partly because I just think there are real experts in this programmatically, there, and I will recommend a few books. Um, there's Project Zero, which is a, a group that's sort of grown out of Black Lives Matter that has some really interesting thoughts about, um, particularly on the training end. Uh, there's a book called Unwarranted by Barry Friedman uh, that I would recommend that has some great recommendations. There's also a book called Locked In by John Pfaff, uh, which is about um, the, the sort of empirical story of mass incarceration. And they all have great stuff. There's everything from getting rid of um, cash bail, mm -hmm. which just, there's just this low hanging fruit of all these people who are in jail because they can't afford to not be in jail. Which like, if we're gonna 
start somewhere, like, well, that'd be a good place to start, right? Funding uh, public defenders, right? Like, putting money into an actual adversarial system so that the machinery just doesn't go like this, right? That's a huge thing that John Pfaff talks about uh, in, in Locked In. Um, a lot of stuff on, more obvious stuff on the drug war. There's a lot of different ways to experiment with ending it or end it. Um, and on the policing front, like, again, to me, the, the, the reason the book is about what it's about and the reason that there's not some sort of programmatic set of recommendations is that the most important thing to me is to get at the root of those politics. Because one of the hard truths of the current system as constituted is that it was not created by some special interests or some backroom deal. It was brought about through democratic means. People voted for this enthusiastically. Political leaders got lots of votes and taught lessons to generations of subsequent politicians that you didn't want to ever be Willie Horton, right? And so unmaking this requires, before we get to the policy prescription, a kind of democratic political commitment and engagement on these issues. It's time for you guys to come up to the microphone and ask questions, if you have some. I'm sure there will be many of you. Um, Could you hear me? Thank you very much. Um, have you a comment on President Trump's connection with Russia and possible impeachment. Uh, no, I, I heard, I saw it on the news today. Um, yeah. And I don't know if it's fake or real. Uh, question about r r the president's connection to Russia and possible impeachment. Um, <laughs> like, this book stuff's great, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, uh, I'll say a few things. One is I don't, I, I don't know where this is all going. Um, the the basic facts of what happened in the election are sort of damning in and of themselves. There was a you know a, a criminal sabotage uh, conducted by a, a foreign state actor with a specific political intent. It was its intent came to fruition, and at the same time that that was happening, uh, the the person who benefited, Donald Trump, was sending all sorts of signals constantly in the public that they were gonna be easier on that, st on that state actor. So sometimes I think like, in the Occam's razor sense, <laughs> right? If we're like, if we're, if we're being good scientists and we're trying like, to like, have the, the most sort of elegant, minimal theory that explains the facts, there doesn't have to be much more than that. <laughs> like, Donald Trump looked into a camera and told Russia to hack Hillary Clinton. <laughs> Literally. So I don't, like, in terms of all the stuff about Manafort and Carter Page and Roger Stone and the investigations and the possibilities of uh, cutouts and the possibilities of meetings and Jared Kushner meeting with the head of a bank that, uh, you know, was on the U.S. sanction list and has ties to the FF FSB and I could go on and on and on. Like, I don't know what it's all going to come to. I'm fascinated. Uh, I want to report it all out as much as possible and keep following the developments. I don't want to get out ahead of what the facts indicate. But I will say this about impeachment. I'll, I'll, I think from the moment that Donald Trump came down the escalator. <laughs> <laughs> Is that funny? I don't know if that's funny. <laughs> um, from the moment that he came down the escalator, there has been some desire, a willful desire for some deus ex machina that would end it all, right? That he would implode, withdraw, be denied the nomination. I've been through like a hundred rounds of this. And I do sometimes think that, that the impeachment desire is, is part of that same temptation. That there's gonna be some deliverance from this. And I tend to think that, like, the default assumption should be that Donald Trump will be the president of the United States for four years. And after a four-year term, he'll stand for re-election. And if he materially makes people's lives better in this country, he will probably be re-elected. And if he doesn't, he won't. And for the people that oppose him, their job is to mobilize themselves using all the nonviolent means of civil society 
to impose his agenda and make sure that he's not successful, as opposed to wishing to be delivered from it <laughs> through some other means. Good evening. Uh, in my life, I've been both a, a participant and an observer of the news media, and I'm, I'm particularly interested in, it seems that it, we've evolved to a state where it, we're more involved in identifying the protagonists and antagonists in terms of who's right and who's wrong and who's up and who's down. And with the Affordable Care Act and all the conversation that's taken place, certainly in the most recent weeks, the ACA didn't take away my insurance policy, and the ACA didn't make me change doctors. But in the whole conversation, why is there no talk about the culpability and responsibility of the insurance companies? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So the question about the insurance companies as bad guys is basically the question, right? That, right. that, that um, and I think you're putting your finger on something that was a pretty profound transformation of how people thought about healthcare, which is that the reason that the Affordable Care Act struggled so much politically is that it became a shorthand for the entire health care market, mm. right? So the Affordable Care Act sort of stamped atop the American health insurance system the branding of Barack Obama and the Democratic Party. But there's still a lot of problems with that system. The insurance companies and the way they operate, um, particularly the high deductible, high premium plans that are particularly happening in the non-group market that's not subsidized. You guys know what that is, yes? Right, right, so those people are getting hammered. Legit hammered, right? So, and, and what happened is because the insurance companies became this sort of regulated entity in the, in the structure of the ACA, and particularly because the law got rid of some of their most egregious and terrible practices, lifetime bans, rescission, bans on pre-existing conditions, et cetera, I think you're right that they kind of like slinked off stage as the villain in the story. And, um, and it was interesting to see what role they played a little bit in, in this battle as well, but polling indicates people still don't love insurance companies. Um, and I think that as you see Democrats increasingly pushing for measures that the insurance companies are going to fight, um, that th they'll come back into sort of the political spotlight. I'm hoping they become more of the conversation. Hi, Chris. Uh, I have a direct TV, so I get to watch you uh, two times every evening, <laughs> in case I miss anything. Uh, it, uh, more on the personal side. Uh, uh -oh. what, is, uh, what is your relationship with Rachel Maddow? She refers to you <laughs> as my personal friend, uh, Chris, and uh, so uh, where did you meet her, and are you really personal uh, friends? <laughs> so Ra uh, Rachel and I uh, are really close. Okay. Um, we, we met through work, uh, but over the years have... have, have have a really deep and important friendship. Um, and I think part of that is um, the experience of the job we have is um, a recipe for insanity. Uh, it's a strange job. Uh, both the kind of unrelentingness of the schedule and the pressure of it, and then also just the psychological distortions that can come with it. And you're constantly trying to like, you know, the, the, the joke I make about getting a TV show is that you, you think you're getting a sports car, but really you're getting a sailboat. <laughs> like you think you're just gonna be like, I'm gonna hop in, we're gonna go wherever we wanna go. But that's not the way it works. There's the wind, which is what people are interested in, what the topics of the time are, what the news is, and then there's the boat, which is the show and the way you produce it and craft it, and then there's the destination you want to get to, which is what your own journalistic commitments are. And over time, you get better at putting those things together to get the boat to where you want to go. But there's 
very few people in the world that I can have a conversation, there's no one that I can have a conversation with about that like Rachel. Like, I think for each other, we are people that can talk about the distinct challenges and experience of the work that we're doing uh, in a way that I think we both cherish. And I think that we really appreciate that as an audience. Thank you. Thank good, you. good work spouse relationship. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Hello, Chris. Uh, I'm Robert, a longtime viewer, first time questioner. <laughs> uh, the, what is the situation in the Washington press corps, the White House press corps, the people like your network, in terms of covering a president who, when he hears a story that annoys him, <laughs> offends him, irritates him, dismisses it as fake news. Yeah. And how do you cover this president differently than journalists have covered previous presidents, even if there's an adversarial relationship? It's different now. Yeah. How is it different, and how do you deal with that? So it is different. Um, the, the kind of berating, the, the, the kind of public shaming is not something that other presidents have done. Um, certainly not like tweets about individual stories. Although I have to be honest, like, you know, Clara will tell you that nothing would be better for Mother Jones than for the president to tweet about how terrible Mother Jones is. Make it happen, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> like, there's a little bit of a WWE aspect to the kind of like, like the heel in the face and the like stomping around the ring. Um, the but, but what I would say, the biggest thing I think is this. A, there's the, just the insanity of the gaslighting. Like, just the, you know, all politicians and seats of power will lie and dissemble and obfuscate and mislead. But they don't do it about, like, things that are in front of your face are easily checkable. <laughs> because they want to preserve some credibility in a sort of, in a kind of tactical sense for like the next round of lying. <laughs> right, like it's a, it's a, you know, in game theory terms, it's an iterated game. It gets played over and over, right? So you wanna like, you wanna kind of maybe save your big lies for later down in the game. 70 days in. That's right. <laughs> so, so that's different. And then there's also this thing that I find really bizarre. You cannot trust the White House on anything, and by anything I mean mundane and banal logistical facts, right? So like there's some degree which you should always be skeptical of people in power, but also like to do your job in the White House press corps, it's like what's the president doing today? Well, at four he's doing this and he's meeting with, and then here's a readout of a call he had with a foreign leader, right? Like even that stuff is untrustworthy. They said the president was going to his golf club in Virginia for meetings and then he shows up in pictures on Instagram in cleats and a white glove. And it's like, you lied about that. <laughs> and that just actually just makes the job, in, in, even in a logistical sense, it makes the job more difficult. I think we have time for essentially two more questions. Go ahead. Okay. It seems, Chris, uh, hi. It seems the country is more and more inclined towards a quick fix for everything. And yet we've seen that everything moves slowly, that's very important. How can we get to the point where we understand that everything needs long-term solutions and long-term planning? It's a great question. I mean, I think, um, I think there's a certain short-termism that is the uh, nature of the human condition um, and all democratic politics. I think certain things that require very long time horizons, particularly in terms of carbon pollution and climate change, are just incredibly difficult to sell to people conceptually. Um, I don't know the answer to that, but I will, but I will say this in defense of the people. Um, I think part of the short-termism is due to the fact that huge swaths of America are, are not seeing material improvements in their standard of living. That, that becomes the pressing thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, it, it would be, it, selling a long-term plan to McDowell County right now is a little tough because it feels like what's happening right now is very pressing and severe and kind of a crisis. 
So I do think that generally making people's lives better, improving the standard of living for particularly large swaths of the working class and the, the basically bottom 80% of the income distribution um, would facilitate making it easier to have a more long-term perspective. Thank you. Hi, Chris. Um, I just finished Twilight of the Elites, and um, at, toward the end you talked about how a lot of social and political change came from people coming together across seemingly different factions. Yep. Um, and I was wondering if post-Trump, if there are places where you see that happening now. I think that, um, I think there's been an incredible reinvigoration of civil society in the wake of the Trump election. And I think there's been a lot of fascinating coalitions that have been built. I mean, I remember in the run up to the Women's March, there was all this stuff about like, oh, they're being too particular about their particular theory and intersectionality and what if I just wanna support them? And, and then it was the biggest protest ever. <laughs> So that's already building across certain lines. But I'll say this as the sort of final thought. Um, I did two, the last two town halls I've done were, done were one was in the south side of Chicago, uh, almost entirely African American, uh, and one was in McDowell County, West Virginia, which was overwhelmingly white. And those places are culturally very far from each other. Uh, racially different and politically quite different in terms of where those places, who they voted for. But man, did I feel like they had a lot of common. Mm -hmm. On the ground, it, did, it felt like these are places that have experienced decline, that are in the midst of tremendous amounts of unaddressed and untreated trauma, that don't have jobs, and I guess I have some vision in which there's some place for coalitions to be built out of that, that there's sort of two possible directions to go, particularly as we see a lot of what's happened, particularly for large swaths of rural and white working class America, which is that in the midst of experiencing this decline, which has been going on for a while but is very severe right now, you can double down on keeping what's yours and building walls and boundaries to protect you. Or as your experience begins to share some of the features of folks that used to be on the other side, there's the early possibility of solidarity. And that's, I think, our only hope. I think that's a perfect place to end this. I'm sorry, I know other people would like to ask questions, but I just want to thank Chris Hayes, um, host of MSNBC's All In with Chris Hayes, editor at large of the nation, the author of the new book, A Colony and a Nation, which, if you have a copy, you can come down to the center and Chris will sign them. Um, I'd like to thank our audiences here on radio, TV, and the internet. This program is part of the Commonwealth Club's Good Lit series, underwritten by the Bernard Osher Foundation. So please, again, if you want to get your book signed, come down to the front, and people will help make that happen. I'm Clara Jeffrey, editor of Mother Jones, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California is adjourned.